let's talk about how often you need to actually take used oil analysis samples. And I'm going to state it up front. This is not an exact science. I'm sure there are reliability engineers who can apply a whole bunch of statistics to it to tell you exactly when you should do it. But is it worth your while to actually calculate that for every single asset? Probably not. So let's look into some of the principles behind when you need to sample, how frequently you need to sample, as well as, let's say, for example, lab turnaround time. How important is that as well? All right. A lot of what we do in this kind of, um, you know, aspect of reliability and trying to predict machine failure, as well as look at the condition of the lubricant, is reliant on this P to F curve, right? And the idea, you know, just to revisit it very quickly, is that we have a loss of usefulness that occurs over time. So typically, machines will have some level of usefulness, then a problem is initiated, and it starts to degrade, and eventually you get failure. Now, if we are trying to, let's say, troubleshoot after a problem has occurred, we are acting in the predictive domain. Whereas if we are doing, you know, taking interventions before the problem has occurred, then we would call that proactive maintenance, right? All right, let's co concentrate first of all in this predictive capability. So this is where we would be taking things like wear metal analysis, right, into account. So the idea is that we're trying to pick up the acceleration of wear as it occurs. And as a result, we can sort of intervene to identify which asset is underperforming. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to stretch that P to F interval, and we're going to look at what is the impact of changing the interval of our different uh, used oil analysis samples. So let's say, for example, we pick an arbitrary amount of time, and we are going to pick, let's say, an even interval of maybe it's 100 hours, maybe it's three months, maybe it's six months whatever it is, we're going to take samples at that specific interval, and we're going to do that continuously. Now, obviously, where does this line up on the curve on the P to F interval? Well, you, you can't sync up the, the problem event with your uh, samples, right? The, the whole point of problem events is that they're kind of random, and you don't know when they're happening. The whole point of oil analysis is that we can pick up when it occurs. So the reality is that it probably looks something more like this, right? Maybe the problem occurs in between taking two samples, right? And then you're hoping the fact that you've taken multiple samples means that you are going to pick up that problem and you're going to pick up an accelerated level of wear before the failure occurs. All right, what you might do is you might look at this analysis and say, well, maybe I'm oversampling, right? Maybe I don't need to do too many samples. Um, that's just contributing time, cost, it's a lot of effort for my engineers to have to analyze that. And you might say, okay, I'm going to cut back on a few and I'm going to extend out the interval. Now that's perfectly reasonable, right? Um, there are many instances in which we might do this and we want to do things like take into account the criticality of this particular machine as well. So less critical machines will get sampled less frequently. More critical machines will get sampled more frequently. Now the danger in doing this is that we have to understand the P to F interval in context. Not all problem events have the same P to F interval. So let me give you an example. Maybe you have a very, very, very slight shaft misalignment, right? Very, very slight. And as a result, you get sort of an accelerating wear pattern. That problem event, so the problem to the failure, it may be months, it may even be years. So the P to F interval is very, very long, very protracted. Let's say, for example, instead, you installed the wrong bearing, right? And the tolerances all, are all off, and maybe there's shaft misalignment as well. Well, that P to F interval is going to be very short. Maybe it's in the matter of days. So realistically, that P to F interval fluctuates, right? It's not, it's not constant. If it was, then it would make our jobs as, you know, uh, machinery technicians much easier. So the reality is, maybe the P to F interval is a bit shorter. Now, all of a sudden, hmm, maybe I've only got one shot at, at finding this particular event before catastrophic failure of the machine. Or perhaps the P to F interval is so short that there is a chance that I never catch it, right? Now I'm relying on chance. I'm relying on which part of my interval cycle um, am I taking a sample? Am I going to catch that in time? So really, when we when we think about the frequency of sampling and how often we're sampling, 
we should think of it in probabilistic terms. The, the, the actual fact is that if you looked at different types of failure modes, there's kind of a distribution of different P to F intervals for a given piece of equipment. So, you know, I, I'm picking an arbitrary number here and I'm centering it around 90 days. I don't, you know, for different equipment, it's going to look a little bit different. But let's say, for example, in this particular bit of kit, let's say it's a bearing. I decided that I'm going to sample once every 120 days. Well, that should theoretically guarantee that I pick up any kind of event which is to the right-hand side of this curve. So any P to F interval which exceeds 120 days, I will be able to pick that up. Anything else is down to chance. If I reduce my sampling interval instead down to something like 60 days, then I'm going to pick up a larger proportion of these particular problem events, right? So it's always it's always something which is risk weighted, right? How many samples do I think I need to take based on the type of equipment that I'm using and the criticality of the equipment? Now, it's almost impossible to do this kind of high level statistical analysis for every bit of kit. And so generally oil companies provide us with kind of uh, handy rules of thumb for different kinds of equipment. How often do we want to be sampling? And this takes into account both the condition of the equipment as well as the condition of the oil. Because if you remember, we're not just sampling to look at wear metals, we're also looking at things like additives, contaminants, as well as the oil degradation as well. Right. Now, the other question that I always get is, um, how fast should the lab turn around my equipment? And I've seen it in a lot of manuals that you should, in some ways, select the lab based upon how fast they're able to turn around a sample. Let me show you why that really shouldn't factor too much in your decision over um, you know, which lab you choose. So let's say, for example, um, I have this particular instance, a reasonably short P to F interval, so I'm picking a worst case scenario here, and I have sampled in the latter, you would say, two thirds of the P to F curve, right? Now, how uh, fast does the lab need to turn around the results so that I, as the engineer on site, can identify that there is a problem and take the machine out of service before the catastrophic failure? Well, the reality is this is the amount of time, right? The time between me taking the sample and when the machine completely fails, if I can get the lab to turn around the sample result in a shorter amount of time than that, then I should be in the clear. And okay, you get more degradation of the equipment but fundamentally, if I can prevent a catastrophic failure, it just needs to be in that amount of time. And of course, that's a, a reasonably worst case scenario, right? Let's say, for example, I sampled earlier in the P to F interval, then I have more time. If I sample later in the P to F interval, then I have less time. But what we, what we know is that basically what we're showing from, from this graph is that sampling frequency is a far more important determining factor in whether I'm going to pick up that error, right? Because if I... If all I did was simply shortened my sampling interval by half, now I've allowed myself way more time for the lab to do this turnaround. Now, with typical P to F intervals being in the order of maybe it's like 60 days or 90 days, um, and my sampling intervals being a matter of, let's say, 30 days, you know, machinery is typically, typically uh, sampled once a month or once every two months or three months, then whether the lab turns around the sample in one day, two days, three days is kind of irrelevant, right? Now, as I said before, um, we're not just doing oil samples in this predictive domain. We're not just trying to identify machine failure. We're also trying to act in the proactive domain. So we're trying to do things like look at additives and contaminants um, as they enter the oil. So as an example, you know, what does what do the uh, contaminants look like? It's typically a sawtooth, right? The contaminants are going to increase and then they decrease because we do an oil change and then they slowly increase and then decrease based on an oil change. And of course, the additives are the opposite of that, right? They start at some level with fresh oil and they slowly degrade. So how often do we want to be taking oil samples may depend on the nature of that degradation and how important it is to the, the, the functioning of this uh, particular machine. So in a landfill gas engine oil, for example, Contaminants are a huge issue. The buildup of acids is a huge issue. And so most of the time, the reason we're sampling is not to look at the degradation of the equipment, it's to look at the degradation and contamination of the oil. As a result, our sampling frequency is drastically reduced.
And often that will be dependent on the degree of contamination in the gas. So, you know, I've worked at landfill sites where the gas is, you know, 2,000 parts per million H2S. Well, as a result, you're going to have to drastically shorten the interval between which you take samples, right? The other thing that we might want to do is we might want to increase the sample density when the oil has degraded because we're trying to trying to finesse when we do an oil change. So when we want to extend the life as long as possible with that oil, we want more and more sample data as we, as we start to approach our use oil analysis limits. As I talked about before, um, the other aspect that can come into it is how critical the equipment is. So as an example, let's say I have a fan blower on site. Well, you've probably done some kind of risk analysis on how important that particular piece of equipment is and what is the kind of consequences of a failure of that particular bit of kit. So I've been to smelting facilities, for example, where the blower you know, it drives the entire process. The blower goes out, then basically the plant has to shut down. Um, and so in that instance, right, both, uh, well, the consequence is very high maybe the probability is also very high, in which case that we're in a bad scenario, right? You want to be sampling that very, very regularly. But if we have redundancy built into the system, then maybe the consequence of that bearing failure is not so high. And as a result, I can reduce my sampling frequency. Now, hopefully what we can do is take more action in the proactive domain to bring down the probability of failure, right? So now you're, you're addressing both consequence as well as probability, and then you could reduce your sampling frequency once again. So I hope you can see that how often you need to take a sample is not really an exact science. A lot of it is going to be dependent on your situation and your site and your plant, right? It's down to criticality, it's down to your capacity, right? It's down to how many samples you're willing to do. Uh, there's kind of a cost benefit analysis that needs to be done. And it's also dependent on the state of the equipment. If you found this content useful, head on over to lubrication.expert. It's a website where there's tons more training courses, they're more structured, and it's available for about 22 US dollars a month.